Welcome to Tales from the Drum. Quantum, Hex, The Cabinet of Curiosity, Advanced Technomancy, Ponder Stibbons. Put these all together and you have the YouTube version of Tales from the Drum. At the end of the video, an actual bit of video featuring the dedicated Medieval Gnome Productions staff members who I am told bear a striking resemblance to cats. But now, without further ado, we have a portal open, so let's file on through into the mended drum. I will take my seat by the fire over here, and we shall get on with the business of the ninth episode of Season 10 of what is for the moment, still known as the Witches and Wizards Portal. You have three days, if you're listening to this on the 17th, to get in your suggestion for a new name for the show. I said the contest is closed last time, I think, but that's not fair because somebody may still have a genius suggestion that absolutely blows my socks off and makes me change my mind. So I guess I'm 99% certain that I do know what the new name is going to be. You're going to have to wait till the 1st of October and the last episode of Season 10 to find out what that's going to be, though. Sorry. have another person who has sent in a haiku, so we actually have a contest between two people. I would love for it to be more than a two-horse race you're going to have to get your poems, haikus, limericks, free verse, what have you, into me by the 20th of September. That's this coming Monday. If you want to be considered for the poetry contest and a chance at a custom episode of your very own. I should probably just mention that I have not had any complaints about custom episodes thus far. We do have a couple of new videos for you on the YouTube channel featuring our staff. The videos are, that is to say, you can find the link in this week's show notes. And since this is the third Friday of the month of September, I won't be doing another show until October. And as I said, that show will be on the 1st of October, but it will be the last of the Season 10 episodes, right then and there. This past week, I have been thinking about the Discworld as a fantasy world, as a fantasy setting. And that makes me think about the amazing job of world building that Sir Terry ended up doing in his Discworld series. Any fiction writer has to do some world building. If it's a short story, then it's a small, compact world. If it's a series of 41 books on the same theme or with the same setting, then the world building becomes a much more arduous and, I would think, at least, daunting task. But Sir Terry was certainly up to it. And looking at it from the vantage point of the full series, what he was able to accomplish is utterly remarkable. There is so much richness of detail and so much development of characters and settings and groups, so much world building, if you will, that Sir Terry does over the course of the 41 Discworld books and all of it, to extend the metaphor, all of it, or much of it was done using bricks of different sizes and sometimes even shapes. And what I mean by that is, to use my favorite example, the trolls of Color of Magic Light Fantastic and the trolls of the era of detritus are very different pictures or formulations of what the Discworld Trolls are going to be. 
So you have a brick that's a different shape and a different size to begin with, but which Sir Terry nevertheless works with and changes the size and even the shape of this particular brick over time without ever losing sight of or letting us lose sight of the fact that this is the brick called Trolls. Who? Yes, the troll called Brick. And so he was not afraid to adapt. He was not afraid to improvise. He was not afraid to be bloody stupid Johnson, even though he knew that sometimes he was saying essentially that Pi was three. But I don't think there can be any doubt that he did a tremendous job of world building and left us with the results of that to enjoy. And the enjoyment of it is in the immersibility, if you will. We are able to immerse ourselves in the disc world because the author, the craftsman, created and crafted such an engaging, such an enchanting, such an arresting place for us to lose ourselves for us to find solace, enjoyment, pleasure in, whether it is by the means of our own reading, by the trip through the portal here into the mended drum, or by some other means. You don't hear much about witches here in the mended drum, as Tiffany Aching learned, by and large, witches and cities don't go together, but they still tell stories in Ankhmore Pork of the time that Granny Weatherwax came here and stayed for some time trying to get a young woman, little girl actually, her protege, into Unseen University because the little girl wanted to be the first female wizard during the time that she was here in aid of that effort, she became acquainted with and possibly stopped along with Rosie Palm, she of the Seamstresses Guild. And a number of years later, when Granny and Nanny Og came to Ankhmore Pork together, Granny took Nanny to stay at Rosie Palm's. And I believe that was the juncture at which Nanny found herself at a loss for words and finally came out with, I'll be Mogadored. She simply could not believe that somebody as upright and uptight, perhaps, as Granny could possibly know a woman who ran a house of good repute. It certainly shook up her picture of Granny, and I think it kind of just shook Nanny up altogether. To use a Star Trek, the original series example, it would be kind of like if Mr. Spock had taken Jim Kirk to a bar, and Kirk had realized that everybody in that bar knew Mr. Spock quite well. But I would say that if Nanny had started to take Granny for granted at all, then this trip and this incident in this trip certainly would have cured her of that. But I don't think that Nanny ever does take Granny for granted. But when it comes to Granny, I just finished reading Lords and Ladies, so a side of Granny that we only see in that book, and that is a more human side of her. Granny does not have friends except for Githa, but Nanny learns, as we learn, that Granny once did have a summer romance, 
And not only that, it was a romance with a young wizard who would end up becoming the Arch-Chancellor of Unseen University and would return for a wedding, during which visit he would encounter Granny and we would learn about the fact that they, possibly in another reality, did get married because it is strongly hinted, at least, that Mustrum did propose marriage. And Granny said no. We see by his behavior in Lords and Ladies how smitten he must have been with Esmeralda Weatherwax, and so I don't think it's without the realm of possibility to say that, yes, indeed, he did propose, and she turned him down. I think even at that age, as a young woman who found herself for the first time in her life, almost certainly, in a romantic situation, Granny was a witch even then first, and she wanted to be the best witch that she could be. She wanted to do it as hard as she could, and she knew that she couldn't if she were married. So they went their separate ways, and each of them, so to speak, ended up at the head of their profession. Mostrum as the Arch-Chancellor of Unseen University, and Granny Weatherwax as the leader of the witches, which they hadn't got. Everybody knew that witches didn't have leaders, they didn't have a hierarchy, they didn't have somebody who was at the top, and so they all agreed that that person was not Granny Weatherwax, but would be if they did, and nudge, nudge, wink, wink, we don't have leaders. I don't think Granny would want to have been a leader in any formal sense. I think she felt like she had enough to do without getting in a position where other witches were looking to her for help and advice. Although, of course, we know that they do, at least to some degree, but witches are all a fairly prideful group of women. And as such, they are very reluctant to ask other witches for help. And as far as Granny's concerned, she's got enough of the people who live in her steading asking her for help. She doesn't need a bunch of her fellow witches coming around and asking for it. And if she did, if they had, I think Granny's advice would have been something along the lines of figure it out for yourself. I think, in fact, that in a nutshell, we could probably describe that as Granny Weatherwax's approach to education. Figure it out for yourself. Although she would demonstrate something and then from there say, figure it out for yourself. I'm thinking about when she shows Tiffany how to move heat and when Tiffany says, well, I want you to teach me to do that. Granny says something to the effect of, well, I just did. You have to figure it out from yourself. From here on, I can't slash won't try to hold your hand and take you through it step by step. You are your own witch. You have to figure it out for yourself. Anyway, as we know, witches and cities don't mix. There is the exception, of course. There is Mrs. Proust or Proust, who owns the Boffo Joke and Novelty Shop in Ankmore Pork, and who is a great proponent of Boffo, which Granny would call headology, and whose wares, we know, are employed by both witches and wizards. It is a fact that Dr. Hicks of the Department of Postmortem Communications wears a dread sorcerer's mask, gotten from Bafo. Miss Treason, with whom Tiffany stays as she's learning the craft, used Bafo, used items from the Bafo catalog to create her persona and the ambiance of her witch's cottage and herself as a formidable and frightening old witch. But mostly witches stay out of Ankh-Morpork, 
And mostly wizards stay in Angmore Pork, although we know that there are wizards who reside in other places, that there are even two now, two other colleges of wizardry on the disc. Most wizards seem to gravitate back to Unseen University at some point after they graduate. A lot of wizards, I think it would probably be found, never leave Unseen University, whether they graduate or not. And because of the nature of the buildings, Unseen University is a place where you can stay and nobody's going to bother you because nobody knows that you're there, or at least nobody knows that you don't have a right to be there. The only person who would possibly know that would be Ponder Stibbons. And as far as I know, Ponder has not gone to the trouble to try to figure that out because he has other fish to fry and because he is an intelligent enough young man to realize that if he did try to take a census of the denizens, students, and faculty of Unseen University, it would be a thankless task, to put it mildly, and would probably cause all kinds of trouble. And we know that Ponder Stibbons really dislikes trouble. But as I was saying, most wizards seem to be residents of Unseen University. There are a few in other places. There's a cheese waller in Quorum, we know. Wizards in the countryside certainly are fish out of water. They demonstrate that in no uncertain terms when Mr. Stibbins and the librarian and Mustram Ridcully go to Lanker for the wedding of Varence and Magrat. Ponder finds himself horrified, it might be fair to say, by the countryside. He's certainly very uncomfortable with it. And he's the only one that we can count as a wizard who would give a, a typical or even stereotypical wizard's response to being out in the countryside. We know that Ridcully, even before he becomes Arch-Chancellor, is well known as a country wizard, a man who hunts and fishes and does those kinds of things, and he is considered to be very eccentric for that very reason. So Ponder's really the only one, because the librarian, being an orangutan, has no problem with the great outdoors. And the bursar, forgot the bursar, sorry bursar, does come along on the trip, but he is, as usual, having a lot of trouble hanging on to the consensus version of reality, and in fact goes pretty much completely bonkers while they are in Lanker. And of course, Ridcully had insisted that the bursar come along because he knew that what the bursar needed was some fresh air. So come out in the country and we'll get you fresh air and you won't need those dried frog pills anymore. Ridcully, as we know, has very robust ideas about health and is a great believer in hygiene as well. But despite Ridcully's confidence that it was just what the bursar needed. That trip to Lanker and the countryside really caused the bursar some problems. And in fact, the bursar utters the famous line of foul old Ron's Millennium Hand and Shrimp at some point during Lords and Ladies and I am as close to certain as I will ever admit to being that the Bursar is the only other character in the Discworld novels who ever utters the line, Millennium Hand and Shrimp. But now the other example that we have of wizards really not being the outdoorsy type is in The Last Continent when they are stranded on the desert island with 
only their wits and Mrs. Whitlow to help them. And they prove themselves completely inept at surviving in a wilderness situation. And in fact, if they hadn't ended up on Mono Island with its unique characteristics, and they had had to stay there for any amount of time, they probably wouldn't have survived. But they are all capable of surviving an extended faculty meeting, even with a committee meeting tacked on to it. All of which is to say it's seldom a very good idea to take a species out of its normal habitat unless they have a good reason for doing so, which I can see both the witches and the wizards adding that last caveat to the issue. But now that we've looked at those two groups of fish out of water and gotten them back into their natural habitat, we will shortly be headed back through the portal to the round world and whatever it holds for each of us. But before we go, YouTube YouTube channel is finally beginning to actually be used by yours truly. And so you can catch some videos of the staff members of Medieval Gnome Productions in action on that YouTube channel. And you can also catch up on Pratt Chips and even the previous week's regular episode, if you so desire. So you can check out our YouTube channel. Remember the new website. We are on pod page now, and that's shaping up very nicely. The Discord bunch would love some more players in our person, place, or thing challenge, ongoing Discord server challenge, and would love, I know we would all love, some other people just to show up, hang out, and chat with us. Last but not least, our Patreon page. And again, I'm trying to get better about making use of its blog feature more regularly. And if you are a Patreon subscriber, you get the upcoming week's Pratt Chips available to you before the upcoming week. That is to say, on Sundays, Pratt Chips for the following week come up on the Patreon site for all Patreon subscribers. That's about all from me for now, so take care, stay safe, stay sane, practice random acts of kindness, and always do mind how you go. Each other's sight.